We're going to continue this discussion now with these distinguished panelists. <sighs> and I would like to turn your attention to this podium where Fred Diaz, a member of the Joint Venture Board, is going to introduce the panel. Fred is the city manager of the great city of Fremont. And we are honored um, to, to, part to participate in the Joint Venture Framework um, as I am honored to serve on its board of directors. <clears throat> Our next topic goes right to the heart of regionalism which Perfect. is a topic um, that our mayor and city council in the city of Fremont absolutely embrace. The Fremont Council is willing to rise to the challenge to look beyond the city walls to be part of the fix of some big problems. Public policy at the local level needs to change, and I believe our jurisdictions to ri will rise to that occasion. I don't just say that because there's probably over 100 council members here. We just heard Paul Sappho say provocative things about the Bay Area and how we should conduct ourselves differently as a region. Now we have a panel of people who are going to talk about this in depth. These are people who are deep thinkers, however they are also solid practitioners. People with experience in local government who grapple with these issues on the front lines and let me tell you who they are. Our first panelist is a member of the California State Senate the Honorable Paul Desagne. Oh, no. He represents Contra Costa oh, County, and he has vast experience tackling the Bay Area's regional issues. Last year, Sen <coughs> Senator Desagne introduced legislation which would create a new regional body, popularly elected and vested with authority for planning and decision making. For the moment, <coughs> uh, that legislation is on the back burner, and the Senator will surely tell us why. Senator, thank you for joining us as part of this, this um, conference. Our next panelist is Mike Garvey, an old friend of mine. He served for many years as the city manager of Santa Clara, and his leadership was widely praised. He's on the panel so he can talk candidly about how regional, regionalism does or doesn't threaten local government. But he's also here because he has vast experience crossing city boundaries, city and county boundaries, creating joint powers agreements and other accords that deliver regional sure. solutions. Thanks, Mike, for giving us the straight talk this morning. Next, we have Aegon Turplin. He is the Regional Planning Director for SPUR, the San Francisco Planning and Urban Research Association. We invited Aegon to the panel because he was the principal author of the special analysis released with the index this year. It is a marvelous piece of work. Aegon, we appreciate you being here to discuss that. Uh, we have a panelist who's not here um, today. Uh, we were with him in a focus group yesterday, and he got um, very sick overnight, so he sends his apologies. That's Bill Dodge. Uh, Bill is of the City State Group, uh, and uh, we hope he uh, has a speedy recovery. Finally, our moderator is none other than the co-publisher of the Silicon Valley Index. He is Dr. Emmett Carson, CEO of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation and, and my colleague on the Joint Venture Board. Emmett, it's, it's very good to have you riding herd on these guys, and we'll all look forward to the discussion. <laughs> Thank luck. you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, panelists. It's all yours, Emmett. Thank you very much. Good morning. Oh, the, this is, the, this is, we're gonna be live, more lively than this. Good morning. <laughs> good, good. So I was asked to moderate this panel and uh, to give a little context before we get going about my view. And so I want to start out by pulling up a chart that Russ talked about. And Rachel. it should magically appear in a moment. Rachel, chart. Rachel, chart. I don't have a clicker this time, so I don't have to worry about it. There we go. There we uh, go. <clears throat> and I'm not going to necessarily focus in Same on the flows, nice graphic, but I yeah. want to try to be an anthropologist. My wife's an anthropologist, and so since she's not here, I want to delve into her area of expertise, which is about culture. And I want to suggest to you that when you see this chart, we are witnessing regional identity formation. We're seeing it happen. You seldom see a new identity being created. And we are witness to that today. Now, what do I mean by regional identity formation? What I mean is that 
in a given geography, people begin to share the same culture, the same habits, the same interflows, that we move from a language that talks about ours being mine and yours to ours being all of ours. So I don't create the distinction anymore between the San Jose airport and the San Francisco airport. I prefer to use the one that's closest when I can, but I see them both as my airports. I have options. I see Oakland as an option for an airport. When I think about going out to dinner, I've got options between San Jose and San Francisco as bookends. When we think about the Niners, how many of you were disappointed at the loss? Okay, we didn't think it was San Francisco's loss, it was our loss. Think about the mayor of San Francisco going to try to get a Super Bowl bid for the Santa Clara Niners. Ooh, regional. We're, we're in the midst of a regional identity formation. And what happens when you start to have a regional identity formation, people move back and forth freely. They don't see the boundaries anymore. And so the question that we have to grapple with is how do we have structures that were set up to do other things when the identity formation was more narrow and more limited geographically to create structures that coexist and or replace those old structures with new structures that reflect the reality that is continuing to emerge. One other point. I was recruited six years ago to come out here to bring together two community foundations, one in Santa Clara County and one in San Mateo County, and I almost got run out of town in three months. <laughs> it can't happen. It's the, they're too separate. They're too different. It will never work. Last year, we opened an office in San Francisco, and I didn't get one letter. People congratulate. Great, great move. You ought to be there. That's part of it. We are witnessing a change in our regional identity. And we are fortunate today that we have three experts on regionalism. The issue for this panel is not for us to get into the nuanced differences that they have as experts. Collectively, what we're going to try to do here today is to say there's not much difference between the three of them. What we want them to do is give you the arguments, your companies, your social organizations, your nonprofits that you are associated with, to talk to the political leaders who are here, to say this regionalism issue is real. And how do we move from a conceptualization of it being real to practicing how it's real so that we don't have 27 separate transportation systems uh, to have to navigate. All right, so that's our goal today. So we're going to start out with questions and I know some are gonna to start to scroll up as you text and I will refer to those as well. But uh, Senator, we're going to start with you for the first question. Last year, you introduced SB 1149 that would have created a Bay Area Regional Commission to bring decisions dealing with transportation, housing, air quality, and sustainable community strategies together all in one place. Why didn't this legislation gain the necessary traction? And what would be its chances in the future? We're just getting started. That's the easy one. <laughs> Senator? Uh, well, first off, let me tell you, it's a, a thank you for inviting me and allowing me to be here. I feel like I should, this is like a support group for over 20 years. I've been coming to meetings like this in the Bay Area, and I feel like we should all start by saying I'm 
I'm a recovering regionalist. Uh, <coughs> um, the, the idea of the bill, just briefly, is, was that uh, something that was started called the Joint Policy Committee that uh, has membership from um, four of, actually all five of the regional agencies, that was actually started by my predecessor, Senator uh, Tom Torlakson, when I was on three of the five regional agencies, and I suggested we try to coordinate. At the time, during the Clinton administration, the Bay Area had been uh, designated out of, um, out of attainment but without a designation in the federal guidelines by the regional administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. And we were struggling with how do we, how do we deal with potentially a conformity freeze on our transportation funds as required by the U.S. Clean Air Act. So it was just uh, very few of us really had an understanding of how uh, transportation, uh, land use, and the economy, and air quality all interacted. So, I thought it was a good idea that it, we formalize a structure uh, rather than having the, all the three of the th agencies trying to deal with this in a very short period of time. Uh, it was, uh, the idea was just to coordinate. Originally, the bill was to um, consolidate ABAG and MTC. Uh, people started screaming. So as courageous, bold thinking uh, elected officials, uh, Tom and I decided to um, try to back off. So it's been, I think, roughly about 10 years, and I thought we should continue the discussion. There's a variety of reasons for that. I'll just mention that when MPOs were created by the U.S. Congress in 1962, the population of the state of California was under 17 million people. Uh, the Bay Area was 3.5 million people. It's now almost 8 million people. Nobody knew really what vehicle miles traveled were, but the average distance for a commuter to take to work was 20 minutes. Um, you had one income and one household, and most people bought a house and stayed in it. And obviously the world has changed in those 50, 60 years. So the rest of the world, and I'm sure you've discussed this or will discuss it, regionalism has happened and regional structural form has, has happened around the world from Hong Kong to Shanghai to London to Auckland to Toronto to Portland to Atlanta, and I just think it's time for the Bay Area as a leading um, private sector area to start to lead in the area of regional governance. So, uh, my view, we heard from the senator why he felt that the legislation didn't go forward. My understanding is that city managers didn't jump up in mass to say, boy, that's the greatest idea, we're for it, how to make it happen. Uh, why not? Those are your colleagues, your friends. Why didn't they help the senator create the momentum to make this happen? <laughs> is, is that how it's going to be, this whole panel? <laughs> <laughs> Not the whole panel, just three You're quarters go easy of on him. Okay. I, I thought the World <laughs> Wrestling Foundation was down the street. Well, let, let, let's step back for a minute and talk about um, uh, interjurisdictional inter cooperation and regionalism. Um, I uh, had about 22 years as a city manager, 35 years in government. I set up many regional, uh, or m more correctly perhaps, uh, many uh, administrative agencies that consolidated service. And in all of the years that I've done this kind of work, I have to say as a common theme, uh, the employees have been wary because it changed their jobs, it changed their, had the potential to change their benefits, their, their uh, salary, their seniority, um, but I've never had employees be adamant that they would not even talk about it. Mm. And I've also not seen um, city councils be concerned about their turf. I've seen them be very careful, saying you need to understand we're concerned about this service, we need to deliver it, but they're ready to talk about something that would threaten the way, uh, that had a potential threat to the way the service has been done. The people who have been adamantly opposed to consolidations and to regional services have been the citizens. And that's always been the, one of the, and, and I thought, well, why would this be? If we're, if we're proposing something, uh, a consolidated parks department or uh, 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 we franchise all the, the in San Carlo, in, in uh, San Mateo County, we, we got 13 agencies to agree on one particular uh, uh, refuse disposal and diversion. A franchise, one franchise, who spent millions uh, of the uh, ratepayers' money building a great system that gives us some cost containment and it's good quality service, um, and yet there was a there, were, there was this anxiety from the public and not from the the people working on it, and I came to understand that when you're trying to evaluate government and how it functions, you can't only look at the objective side of it. 
If I were to say to you, if you were to say to me, we have 101 cities in the nine Bay Area counties, is that too many? I would say objectively, there's no question about it. We're spending a tremendous amount of money on duplicate administrative overhead because there are so many small cities. So objectively, sure, there's way too many cities. We could probably get by with half as many. Um, but if you were to ask me subjectively, are there too many cities, I'd have to say I'm not so sure because I think our people want it that way. And after all, if, if, uh, if you and I sit in a restaurant at two different tables and I order an expensive meal and a dessert and spend a lot of money and you eat a frugal, intelligent, healthy meal, um, you're not in a position to tell me I'm spending too much money. It's my money. It just as if I, if I say to a small city, you have your own police department. It's very costly. Why is that? If you could merge police with the city next door, you'd have a, a much uh, more efficient, much cheaper operation. They have every right to say to me, it's my money and I prefer to have my own police department. And so that's our, that's our big barrier. It's, it's not so much do we know what to do objectively, it's is are we, uh, as, a, as a community, are we ready to do this? If we speak in favor of somebody making intelligent decisions about placing development and housing and, and jobs in, in proximity and dealing with transportation, we're all in favor of that. But the other side of the coin is we're then saying, well, in the neighborhood where you live, some other agency far away in a remote location is going to make decisions that are going to have an intimate effect upon your neighborhood and upon your personal life. We need to reconcile this objective and subjective side of it. We need to have a lot more dialogue and communication before we're ready to go forward. I liked Mark's bill. I think most city managers did like Mark's bill. Um, because it wasn't uh, the final solution. Rather, it was, it was a path that we could follow to wrestle with those difficult subjective factors. Thank you. So, Aegon, uh, what uh, Mike is calling uh, subjective, I would say, I would call it culture. Uh, is it really, you know, the people's fault? Uh, it's not the elected officials' uh, failure to lead. It's the people who elect people who don't lead because we like it that way. We want the dysfunction. We want the 101 uh, municipalities. We want the 27 transportation systems. We, we like it that way. And so it's really us and it's doomed. Well, I think it's, it's, an, it's an interesting framing of it, but I think it, it's a mix of, an, a, an, of a number of things. And I'm, I, I come to this kind of regional debate as a, as a Bay Area native and not one that's been, in a sense, bruised by the battles of, of past generations trying to go forward with trying to merge some of the agencies or come up with different solutions. So, <clears throat> and I think that, that, that my perspective on it is we start from seeing some of the great successes in our region are the product of having established some kind of governance system. That these images of the bay that we saw were actually, we had a bay that was being threatened being filled entirely or, or in large part and turned into a shipping channel. It was actually citizens that saw that threat came together and said that this is a precious resource. And it's something that actually now, because we have this large body of water is an incredibly important asset to our quality of life, which then reinforces our economic competitiveness because people like to be here. So citizens and civic involvement in the organization I work for has many citizens, many kind of, is very much about civic involvement, are people that have, have moved in the past towards regionalism, towards making structures that try to manage things and deal with these trade-offs. I think one of our challenges, though, is that we establish these incredible regional entities coming out of World War II into the 50s and 60s to deal with air, to deal with transportation, to deal with the bay, but they were single-purpose entities. They had a single purpose. Let's try to make sure that the air stays clean. Let's try to make sure that we manage development around the bay appropriately. Let's try to distribute transportation funds. They don't deal as well with the conflicts or contradictions between them. What if we want to make sure to build lots of development near our transit system to make sure we get the best out of that, out of that billions of investment we have? It's a very big goal. It's part of our state climate change law to make sure that we can live and work um, and use our transit system. But some of those places happen to be near freeways and the air is a little bit dirtier. So we have some laws that come out from the, or regulations that, that might make it more difficult to build directly near some of those freeways. So there's a conflict between getting people near transit and also maybe making sure that there's not um, a little bit of a dirtier air around new residential development. We don't resolve those as well because we have different agencies that then have their own 
um, elected boards that, that kind of compete with each other. The Joint Policy Committee was a movement forward to try to get them to talk, but it didn't create any new powers. And it didn't create the ability to actually resolve those tensions and to come up with a new balance. And I think that's where something we need to try to work on now. So, so what's the low-hanging fruit? for us. So we, the three of you agree about the importance of regionalism. You understand the issues. We know the dysfunctionalities. What's the lowest hanging fruit that we could say, boy, we could make this happen in the next year. This is possible. Or are all of the solutions three years, five years, ten years, uh, what, what could, for each of you, what is something that you think is practical? that we could grab onto and hold and say, we ought to be able to do that in a year. And these are the one or two people who could actually move that. I mean, name names. Who would like to start? I, mean, I could jump in on one, and then, and then we'll go from there. A topic we, we've started touching on is transportation, but specifically in transit. So Emmett mentioned we have 27 transit <laughs> operators, but we don't have that many when we look at regional services. So let's talk about BART and Caltrain. And AC Transit has these Transbay buses on the Bay Bridge, and Dumbarton Bridge has some buses, and we have a number of different operators. They look and feel like different systems. They have different fares. They have different schedules. Yes, they have different gauges, as Russ mentioned before. There's an option on one end, you merge them all together, create one agency. There's an option on the other end that we just paint the vehicles a similar color, give them one schedule, give them one map. So I think within that range, there's a whole lot we could do to make the experience of moving around the Bay Area on transit look and feel like it's one system. So, so I would say that's something very so much. So Aegon, in that example, field. just to push you quickly, because I want to get the, the other two as well. In that example, is it the leadership of those three agencies that have to do something? Are there governing bodies of those agencies that have to agree? Who has to do something to create a single schedule or to create uniformity of fares? Who, specific, who, needs, who, do, who do we need to write to? Who do the companies need to pressure? Who do we need to talk to elected officials to say, convene something, who? So I think if, if, if you start on just the, the merging the schedule and other things, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission has taken on that question. But when they took it on, a lot of the operators said, well, we're really different from each other. We have different environments. Some are denser, some are less dense. We can't be measured by the same rules. And there was resistance to it from, I think, the transit operators themselves. They didn't see a lot of the incentive in that. But I think the regional entity, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, could say, well, you're not going to get access to X, Y, and Z money unless you're willing to work on some of this together. Some of you know that we now have something called Clipper, a card that allows you to go across a number of systems, but what it really does is it allows each system to take a fare from you. They didn't lead to any resolution of those conflicts and fares when they put it forward. That was something that could have happened. The state, though, is involved because BART's a state agency and some of these other ones. But I think that, that some of it could certainly happen just at the scale of MTC working on the money and using the money as an incentive to get people to work together. Senator, or Mike, what's your low-hanging fruit example of what we could do in the next year? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there is anything as low-hanging fruit. In okay. This. Um, part of it is we get stuck in a discussion of uh, local government versus regional government, and I, I, I'm of a mind that we should just look at how people live in the Bay Area and how it's different from when we formed the, the structure of governance in the, in the Bay Area, both the regional level and the local level. Um, the people who come to city council meetings or legislative meetings aren't the people who are stuck in the snow grade in my, in my district trying to get down here because they're too busy and they're two income households and that's what you hear a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so we tend to be, and I include myself in this, um, fairly insular in the group who are civically engaged in, particularly in city life. And so we have to change the discussion. I think one of the real promising things in the Bay Area is uh, the, Bay Area, the business groups, the Bay Area Council, EDAP and the East Bay, uh, Contra Costa Council in, in Contra Costa where I live, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group are trying to get an economic development strategy that is at least advisory to the regional transportation plan and the state implementation plan at the Air District and the arena numbers around housing at ABAG. I think when you look at regions that have changed successfully so that um, 
the residents who live regionally uh, get more benefit and more responsiveness. It's usually come, with the exception of BCDC, as Igon talked about, and activists usually come from the business community. And it's ironic to me that here in Silicon Valley and in the Bay Area that we're, in my view, behind cities like London or Hong Kong that are global economic powers and, and want to be more like you. Um, they look at their regional structure of governance and, feel, and, and have made significant changes. So I, th I think the business community is probably the great hope for, for this area and the Bay Area to put pressure on us to look at how we deliver services more than, more than just the form of government, but how do we deliver services? So we've got about uh, 20 minutes left, and a lot of great questions are starting to come up. So Mike, I'm going to direct this to you and to add in so we can start to get some of the questions. Two of the questions asked about it, they were related. One said, how do you get the average Joe, the average person to care about this issue of regionalism? And for me, a related question was, hey, look, city governments are broke. The state uh, is, is a, barely above water now, and it's historic. In the last few years, has been broke. How do you pay or get people to buy into uh, the regional system and another layer of government and the expenses that attend that. So how do you get people to care and how do you get them to care enough for whatever this infrastructure would have to be? And I'll start with you, Mike, and then ask one of the other of you okay. to chime in. Thank you. And it, that, that does, um, it does tie in with, with the thought I had, had tried to express earlier that if we're going to move forward, yes, there will be leadership from the elected officials, there'll be leadership in the business community, but we also need to bring the entire community forward. The era we're in right now is uh, one of, of dramatically increased citizen involvement and engagement, and they don't engage typically when they're happy, so that the meetings tend to be somewhat contentious, but the statistics that Rush shows about the the education and the income and the sophistication of the, of the Silicon Valley population also tells us that that means we have um, a, a much more complicated uh, arrangement in trying to deal with our citizens, even as we have much better potential for doing that. I wanted to talk about um, one interesting experiment. It, 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 in San Mateo County, there's a council of governments, and I'll, I'll spare you the, 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 the details. It's called the City County Association of Governments, or CCAG. It was created at a, a time when the legislature had, had uh, 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 approved two new mandates. And one was that 50% of, of the waste had to be diverted from uh, landfill. And the other was that every county was to create a congestion management plan and uh, with some extra sales tax, uh, excuse me, gas tax money uh, from the state, they were to implement plans to deal with congestion. Both were mandates. Both had to be adopted on a countywide basis. And in San Mateo County, the cooperative arrangement made was that the cities and the counties would join together into this joint program to affect those two programs. It's been going for some years. There was a lot of trepidation at first, but there was the mandate from the state behind the whole thing. So everyone went forward and joined this, this organization. Three or four years later, the members of uh, CCAG's board began to talk about taking on additional duties and responsibilities. And what they were saying was, we're ready as cities to give up some of our control and some of our power into this countywide agency. And the reason they were willing to do it is because they saw it in operation and they were comfortable with it and they knew that this was a fair and reasonable way to do it. And that's, we have to somehow reach that point with all of our uh, agencies and all of our cities where they're comfortable saying, let's try this, let's hold hands and go forward and, and not be uh, dissuaded by the fear that we now have. One other example I'll talk about, and I'll try and be quick. Um, many of you are familiar with the Grand Boulevard Initiative. That's a program involving 19 cities and two counties from Daly City to San Jose, uh, doing, uh, trying to coordinate planning in a one mile wide strip centered on El Camino Real. And in order to do this, uh, uh, we've had to put in um, the representatives of all the cities and the counties, the regional agencies, the transit districts, VTA, and SamTrans are heavy supporters. Caltrans is involved. And we attempt to come together and talk about how we build a new city. In that process, the cities have voluntarily agreed to, to put a lot of restrictions on their own land use authority. And they've done that voluntarily because they could see the regional benefit. Had we tried to mandate 
that they give up that control. They never would have done it. And I think that's a model for where we need to go in the future. It's going to be hard and slow, but that's how we're going to build this. Thank you. So, hey, Don, uh, if we go from Mike's point about it, it can't be this controlling piece, but it has to be some flexibility in it. Are there opportunities, that one of the questions that came up was about electric vehicles. Are there some opportunities around areas to create a shared understanding, like around an electric vehicle power outlets or those, those kinds of things, where no one sort of has a policy already in place, and you can move into that space to create a regional approach to new areas where there aren't existing power structures or or uh, infrastructure issues that have to be accommodated? Well, I think there's certainly areas that one could go into. I mean, the electric vehicle piece, that there's a lot of that starting to be funded at, at the regional scale. And I'm not sure if that there's a need for a new governance entity. I would also caution moving in that direction of saying, let's create some new regional entity that deals with one issue. Let's take sea level rise. We know it's happening. It is the gravest existential threat to, to this region and to many regions all over the world in the near term and in the long term. East Palo Alto, just in late December, was almost you know, two feet of water flooded from the San Francisco Creek, and it could have gotten much worse if the tides had been a little bit different. We are facing some of those very serious threats that we have to respond to on a cross-jurisdictional level. We could do so with a new entity. I think that we should look and think about not doing that, of actually trying to take some of the existing ones we have and get them to kind of work together or engage differently. You're also, though, getting at the question of how do you get the local governments to want to participate in this? And my sense is this is where, unfortunately, money might have to be a big piece of it, that, that some of these, the, the question of what should I do? do I, I'm not going to give up my local land use authority and turn it over to someone at a, at a higher scale. But at the regional scale, we do fund local streets and roads often. We fund a lot of the improvements on the highways. So there's money that comes come down from the regional scale. We could tie it a little bit closer together. If you don't want to build this in accordance with a regional vision that tries to shift our, our overall development pattern towards transit and away from being, being auto intensive, the region maybe doesn't have as much of a responsibility to fund your local transportation needs. And that's one way that you can try to People won't like that, but it's certainly a way. And it's, we're, we're moving baby steps in that direction, but I think we could take a really big step towards that. So, Senator, let's build on this point about the sea level rise. And it, it seems to me it's a, a compelling issue for the state to want to be involved. There are opportunities for partnerships because, as Russ mentioned, there are major corporations that are in the, some of the lowest uh, lying areas here, the transportation issues. Is that a thematic approach to both um, bring in the, the, the state to, to take leadership with local jurisdictions, going back to what Mike said, that all have to get into this problem and, and agree that that's a framework? Or is it just too far off and too complicated to get people to pay attention until the flood is here? No, there's the uh, bay, uh, the BCDC, which has the authority over the bay, as Egon explained, actually did a plan and they mm -hmm. had some stumbles because it, when it went out to local government beyond their governing body, uh, people reacted and said, you can't restrict development like this. Um, so they had to back off and come back and they settled a lot of that at the Joint Policy Committee where the other agencies had public hearings and had a discussion. So all of these things are happening. Uh, SB 375 that Senator Steinberg authored, and I was the co-author of when I was in the assembly, I, the Bay Area is going through what's called a sustainable community strategy to deal with land use and transportation and air quality, particularly as it relates to Assembly Bill 32, which was internationally landmark legislation by my colleague, uh, Senator Fran Pavley from Los Angeles, to deal with carbon emissions. Um, in two years from now, cap and trade funnies, funds a uh, portion that CARB is dealing with when it comes to fuels will start to be distributed. And all of this is taking place. So I don't, we're, 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 when we talk about a regional agency sort of being a Soviet model of command and control, I, th uh, that's not something I support. And I think Egon has talked about that in his work. We have structures, it's just how they interrelate, 
how they continue to empower local government, not overpower them, but be more responsive to a very different social and environmental world that we're part of in the business world. Michael, you certainly mentioned uh, the El Camino Real and, as, and other examples of how uh, across jurisdictions we are doing more and being effective. How does sea level rise play into that? What, what is your notion of the sense of urgency among city managers and local jurisdictions to want to take that issue on and what do you think could be done uh, and by whom? I think that's an issue that um, the cities tend to feel they can't control it. They'd be willing to support some effort in a larger scale, but they can't do it themselves. Um, but, but also, when you talk about, um, you talk about sea rise, it, like a lot of our issues, you really can't, you can't take it down to one topic. You need to look at the land use issues. You need to look at the carbon emissions. You get into a whole series of factors that are causal, we believe are causal, contributing to the problem with sea rise. Um, and those kinds of things uh, are, uh, the cities will get involved more in that sort of thing. What we see along El Camino Real is a growing um, awareness and support for the notion that they want more dense development uh, in the vicinity of tra fixed transit facilities. And the idea is to reduce the number of, of miles vehicles are driven and to do that in a way not by restricting people's behavior, but by giving people other options and empowering them to do some other things. Um, We've all been through this. I live in San Carlos. If I want to ride BART, I have to either drive to a BART station, ride Caltrain to a BART station, or ride a Sam Trans bus to a, to a BART station. That's a problem that we have, and it's much more serious than only people being able to meet and gather around a room. It's the sort of thing that Egan's been talking about. These are not, not easy problems to deal with, but I think at the city level, you'll see the city people much more interested in questions like that as an aspect of what to do about the sea level change because there's not much they can do. I know there are some cities that have built seawalls, and um, that's not the best solution. And uh, if every city has to do that on their own, it's, it's wasteful, and it's not going to solve the problem either. So I've been given the high sign that this panel is going to conclude a little early. Um, so as a last, <laughs> I, you know, they said I'm getting too controversial here. They want to pull the plug. Uh, <laughs> so as, a, as the last question for each of you, and if you could be <laughs> succinct, we've got an assembled group of business leaders, of community leaders, of elected officials. Name one thing coming out of this meeting we should try to go and do over the next year that would promote regionalism from your vantage point. What's the most important thing that from your vantage point this assembled group could try to commit to do in the next year to move this issue forward. And Senator, let's start with you. If we could. I'd say um, do a Google search on regional reform. Uh, just become more knowledgeable. Uh, do what you're doing today and be open-minded about it. Um, the, as Mike sort of alluded to, sort of the old expression about everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die. Um, everybody wants to be a, a visionist. Um, but we're all a little reluctant to change anything. So somewhere in there is a challenge for the Bay Area, I think, to really look at what other uh, regional entities did and be competitive and maintain our quality of life. Michael? Um, it, it's too bad that Bill Dodge, the other uh, intended <coughs> panel member, was Ill, uh, is ill right now because uh, Bill is working on a concept called a regional charter. And the concept is to attempt to form a, a regional... Um, gathering of people that are going to wrestle and deal with these issues, uh, the stakeholders working together, not with any um, dictated or predicted result, but rather the idea that people who are intelligent and of good faith and representing all the different aspects of a region can come together and craft a solution and then ultimately create some kind of an entity that will have buy-in that can deal with these regional problems. And by the way, Bill did ask me to say that if any of you are interested in getting a copy of his paper, if you'll leave a note with uh, Joint Venture, they'll make sure that he'll make sure that he sends you a copy directly of, his, of the paper he's working on. I think that, that this group in this room would be an outstanding start for a very significant part of the Bay Area if we were to start that kind of a dialogue, those kinds of meetings along the line of some kind of a regional charter, a brand new definition of what a new entity would, uh, could do and accomplish. And Ega? 
Well, I'll, 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 I'll break the rules by answering very quickly three things. One, something like this, and I think the redistricting commission in the state gave an example of, of a group of people coming together and then, and then putting it out there. So I think that holds promise. Two, I've talked about this notion of regional transit and trying to get the, our system to look and feel like one, if not merge, but that's, that I think it's something we should really start working on. Third one, we haven't touched on at all, and this is, could be controversial, but there's a good example of it. It's figuring out a way to try to resolve some of the conflict around around local taxes and maybe try to share a little bit of them. I should say share the growth in some of the taxes that are collected locally, particularly sales. There's been bills in Sacramento to try to do this. Maybe we could pilot this at the county scale. They do it in Minneapolis. It reduces some of the inequities between existing jurisdictions. Some have high service needs, some have high sales. I think that's something that we could begin to explore at the level. So those are three. Please join me in thanking this outstanding panel. Thank you. And Emmett, thank you to you. <laughs> Emmett, thank you. Thank Fabulous you. job wrangling these guys. This has been um, a grounded conversation, and it's been an insightful one. We really appreciate it, and also a candid one. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have one announcement that pertains to the discussion that you just heard. We were talking about low-hanging fruit and things that we could do this year. Well, there is one thing that Joint Venture is going to do this year. We are announcing today a new uh, luncheon program that we're going to be hosting, and we're calling it It's Just Lunch. <coughs> I want to tell you how this works. We're going to invite public sector officials from San Mateo County and Santa Clara County to have lunch once a month, and we're going we're gonna to pay for lunch. It's on us. We're going to have lunch at the county boundary. It'll be somewhere right around the San Francisco Creek, right there. Except you're and the whole idea <laughs> is simply to get public sector officials from those two counties, cities and counties, into the same room. Uh, it may surprise you, but they don't necessarily know each other. They don't interact uh, on a frequent basis. And our hope is that just by having lunch, we'll get to know each other, start to build relationships of rapport and trust so that Later on, we can start having very substantive conversations about the harder things in the trade-offs that we might need to contemplate as we think about a regional future. So we're just calling it lunch. It's just lunch. There'll be interesting speakers from around the region, but most importantly, dialogue among the people who are representing us on these important city and regional issues. And in a year from now, we'll look forward to reporting back to you how, uh, how it's been over lunch. All right, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you to our panel.